I said at the end of the last session that what we want to do uh, is see if this framework can be applied to a more general uh, problem, also a tour problem, but one in which we're, we're given not just the graph and the weights, but a subset of vertices, and the goal is to visit those vertices, uh, and, and the other ones are optional. So I have an example here. Uh, you're given a, a, a set of points, and you want a tour that will travel around and visit those points. It doesn't have to visit the entire city. Okay. So that's called, uh, so it's traveling salesman on a subset of, of vertices. Um, so we need a more general spanner result in order to do that. So uh, this, this result I, said, I, I, I described uh, in the last session about approximating distances, that's called a spanner result. We need a more general version of that. So let's think about what, what kind of result we need. Right? So the, the key step in applying the methodology is this transformation from G input to GE. G input to G involves the leading edges in the case of traveling salesman problem so that the resulting graph has weight that's a, a, a constant times the weight of opt in the original graph. And uh, we, want the, uh, we want the tour length to be approximately preserved. That is, we don't want to delete so many edges that the tour length goes up a lot. We want the tour length to still be at most 1 plus epsilon times the tour length in the original graph. Now we found that the way to do that uh, for the ordinary traveling salesman problem, where all the vertices have to be visited, was to preserve distances between all vertices. And the natural uh, lower bound for the, the weight of such a thing is the weight of the minimum weight spanning tree. And we found that we could exceed that by some factor, some small factor depending on epsilon. So now, uh, what's the analogous problem uh, in, in the case of um, finding a tour that visits a subset of vertices? Sorry? So what do you mean? Good. So, the, so what you're saying is, in order to even achieve connectivity, so but before, before we get that, I, I hold that thought for, for a moment. What I want to ask is, what, what I'm trying to get at is, is what kind of structure do we, do we want in order to carry out, what, 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 should, what should G do in order for uh, G to approximately preserve the tour length among the subset of vertices? Remember, remembering what property we used in G last time, we required that the distances between all pairs of vertices be approximately preserved. And why was that sufficient? For, because a tour consisted of a series of shortest paths. So as long as uh, between each pair of consecutive terminals, uh, the tour took a shortest path. So as long as we preserve those shortest paths between the pair of terminals, uh, we're appro approximately we're approximately preserving the tour length. So what property do we want for the graph when we only need to visit a subset of those, uh, uh, where the set of terminals is is not the whole graph, not the whole, all the vertices? The minimum what? Well, you're, you're getting, a, you're on the right track, but you're getting a little ahead of where I want to be. That's right. You only need, so this is a weaker condition, notice. We, we need to preserve distances, approximately, between pairs of terminals, between pairs of vertices that must be visited. We don't need to preserve them among all vertices. So, for example, in this picture, 
we want to subgraph the preserved distances among, among the, the red circles. This is part of a, a, a much bigger map of the Boston metropolitan area. Uh, we don't need to preserve distances among all vertices, in the, uh, all, all intersections in the Boston area, just between these selected vertices. So is the problem clear? Here, uh, we need a subgraph that approximately preserves distances between vertices in that subset. That's the goal. So, so this was not known. Uh, it, it wasn't known if even such a. Uh, uh, so, it, it, we need an additional couple of properties. We we want the subgraph to have small weight, right? Uh, and we want to be able to compute it efficiently. So small weight meaning, well, what? In order to apply it in our methodology, we need the weight of this subgraph to be, at most a constant times, the weight of opt, okay? The weight of the minimum tour visiting these vertices. Now, in the last session, what, what did we do? We bounded the, 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 the weight of G in terms of what? In, in, in terms of the minimum spanning tree. And now, what's the natural thing to use as a bound in this setting, where we're only looking for a tour between selected vertices? The Steiner tree, right. So we want to relate the distance uh, the, the total weight of this graph to the weight of a minimum Steiner tree. So uh, I'll come back to that point. So a Steiner, a, well, uh, all right, so I'm, I'm mentioning, uh, so a Steiner tree for a graph and a set of terminals is a minimum weight tree that connects those terminals, that uses those, those terminals and also possibly some other vertices. And you've, you've seen this before. Uh, in, in, in approximation uh, algorithms. You know that probably, uh, do they know that, that there's a factor two approximation that's fairly easy? Uh, no, okay. Um, and there's a lot of work on getting better factors for general graphs. All right, and now uh, a, a Steiner tree on the one hand is the, it's the right measure, why? So on the one hand, in order for the subgraph to at least achieve finite distance between the terminals, between the subset of vertices, you need there to be, you need them to be connected. You need G to connect the, the terminals. And the minimum weight to do that is the weight of a minimum Steiner tree. That's, that's the definition of Steiner tree, of minimum weight Steiner tree. So on the one hand, that's the kind of natural lower bound for this structure. On the other hand, we want to make sure, uh, we, uh, and, and so what we hope to do is find a subgraph whose weight is at most a constant times the weight of the Steiner tree, the minimum Steiner tree for those terminals. Now suppose we do, does it work with the, fr with the, the framework? Okay. Remember what we want from, uh, uh, according to the framework, what we want is for the weight of G to be at most a constant times opt for, for the original graph. Opt, in this case, is the tour length. So if, if the weight of G is at most a constant times the weight of the Steiner tree, is that sufficient? We don't, right. But suppose that we get a graph G whose weight is at most some constant times the minimum Steiner tree. Right, right. The cost of the tour, the tour gives you a Steiner tree. Well, it's not necessarily the, the minimum one, but it is some Steiner tree. So the cost of the tour is at least the cost of a minimum Steiner tree. So indeed, if we found a subgraph that preserved distances, uh, uh, and, and, and up to a one plus epsilon factor, and had weight at most a constant times, uh, the optimal tour, or the optimal Steiner tree for those points, 
that would work for the, for the framework. So that's what we'll set out to do. OK, so this is what this says. Uh, the minimum weight to achieve connectivity is the weight of the Steiner tree connecting that subset. And uh, one can show that there exists such a subgraph. There exists a subgraph uh, whose weight is some function of epsilon, which we consider a constant, times the weight of the minimum Steiner tree, such that now the property it achieves is only for all pairs u and v in the subset s of vertices, uh, the, the, the vertices the tour is required to visit, the distance is approximately preserved up to a 1 plus epsilon factor. So the significant change from the previous setting is here we only require these vertices to be in the subset S. The, so that allows us to get a much cheaper subgraph. Okay. Now, uh, before going into that construction, I want to talk about an even harder problem, which is Steiner tree itself. Can we apply this framework to solve the Steiner tree problem. So here's an example of the Steiner tree problem. This is at my, host, my home university. They were putting in uh, hot water pipes uh, that would run through the, uh, through the roads. And uh, this, is, this is part of the solution that they, they had. And really, they were, when they came up with a design for how the pipes would go through the roads, they had, to, they had to dig up the roads. It's a lot of work. So uh, it might make sense to find a minimum Steiner tree that connects the, the, given, uh, the given locations. So what do we need in order to apply the framework for Stein, to Steiner tree? Well, number one, I mean, does the framework even apply to Steiner tree? Okay. Let's think through the steps. All right. So the first step, we have to, we, uh, we're going to be using the deletion uh, then contraction approach. So first we have to delete a set of edges so that the resulting graph G has weight that's a at most a constant times the weight of the minimum Steiner tree and that approximately preserves the Steiner tree uh, optimality. So, so that the, the weight of a Steiner tree in G is at most 1 plus epsilon times the weight of a Steiner tree in the original graph, G input. So it approximately preserves Steiner tree weight uh, and, and, ha, and, and, as I said, has weight order, order uh, the Steiner tree weight. All right, so that's the, that was the first step according to the methodology. What's the second step? Anyone remember? remember? So once we have G, So we're going we're gonna to find a, we're going to look at k different for some parameter k or, or p, I think, in this, in this presentation. Uh, uh, we, we find p different uh, partitions, three, p different uh, um, decompositions. And we, and we look at the weight of the edges crossing that, each of these. And we choose the one that has the smallest weight. And we know that that smallest weight is at most 1 over p times the weight of G. Now we contract those edges uh, to get a low branch width graph, and we solve Steiner tree in each of those, uh, in each of those parts. Then we take the solutions for the parts, union them together, and union them uh, uh, with what? Well, with the contracted edges. And that will give you a Steiner tree for the, for the original graph, for G, and therefore for the original graph. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about in the case of the traveling salesman problem is how you incorporate these edges. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I sort of skimmed over that. I mean, I, I, the, one, one of the things, I, you don't, in, 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 finding a, 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 um, in finding a traveling salesman tour, you can't just take the union. You have to, you have to work them into the tour. But it's easy to show that you only need to incorporate at most two copies of the contracted edges. Uh, each, each, each contracted edge, uh, you incorporate zero, one, or two copies. And that suffices to, uh, to lift the solution to the, to the uh, uncontracted graph. In Steiner tree, it's even easier. You, basically, you just add the edges that were contracted. Uh, 
and, and that, will, that will give you a Steiner tree. So for, for Steiner tree, the, uh, the, let's, let's see, in order to show the, uh, the scheme works, we need to show that uh, the dynamic programming part works, that you can solve uh, Steiner tree in a graph of bounded branch width. And that turns out to be not too hard. Uh, you can, you can, so if the branch width is, is, uh, is W, you can solve it in, in time that's exponential in W times, uh, times N. So the tricky thing in Steiner tree, as in most of these algorithms, is this first step, which is finding the subgraph that approximately preserves uh, the optimum value. Uh, so we can prove this theorem. It's, it's, it's rather complicated. I'll give you an outline of how it's done. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, uh, in, the, in the traveling salesman uh, problem, because that's a little simpler. But here's the basic idea. We came up with something called a brick decomposition. So brick decomposition is a decomposition of the planar graph. You start with, the, uh, start with some, some tree. In this case, it suffices to do a two approximate Steiner tree. Okay. So it, it doesn't have to be in, uh, the, the minimum Steiner tree. It's within a factor of two of, of, of minimum. And now the, uh, the brick decomposition, basically you use uh, a, an algorithm similar to the one we used, similar in spirit to the one we used uh, in the last session for augmenting, throwing some other edges in in addition to that tree. Okay, we add more and more edges, so is, uh, and we eventually get this, this, uh, this graph um, I call M. And the faces of that graph uh, are, are, are bricks. So, there's lots of stuff inside there from the original graph. Now, uh, we can prove, uh, oh, so, so, so now for the purpose of the algorithm, we apply this transformation. For each of these bricks, these faces of this graph M, we select points along the boundary called portals. So, this idea of portals is, uh, has been used a lot. The idea is that it, it, you can only get into or out of the brick via the portals. So you have to choose enough portals along the boundary so that the optimum solution doesn't have to go far, doesn't have to be disturbed, perturbed far to get through the portals. So let's say you have a, uh, an optimum uh, tour here in the original graph. Well, that corresponds to an optimum tour uh, in this graph that I've modified with the portals. So I modify the graph so that you can only get in and out of the, the, the bricks using portals. And, uh, and that involves perturbing the tour. Right? Maybe the tour crossed some point that wasn't a portal. So we're going to increase the cost of the tour by a, by a little amount. You have to detour uh, around to get to the nearest portal. But you can show that those detours don't add too much uh, to the distance. And so uh, the tour length uh, doesn't increase too much. So there's a 1 plus epsilon approximation, approximate tour that uses the portals. So now how do we get this graph? Uh, well, we'd include this brick, the brick, the brick boundaries, and then we in also include portal, portal to portal distances within the brick. And similarly for Steiner trees, you can show that, uh, you that, that you can select portals, not too many portals, a constant number per brick, 
so that the Steiner tree can be perturbed to use tho those portals. And in perturbing the Steiner tree, you don't increase its cost too much. At most, uh, a, uh, a one plus epsilon uh, factor. Okay, and how do you, uh, uh, so given, that, given that's true, how do you construct this graph G for a Steiner tree? Well, one way, which is a little bit brute force is, within each brick, you take every subset of the portals and find the optimum tour within the brick that connects those portals. Now, there are only a constant number of portals. So each of these Steiner trees is fairly easy to find. Uh, in fact, the brick has a special structure. All the portals are on the boundary. So uh, you can find the Steiner tree in polynomial time. And there are only a quote unquote constant number of such Steiner trees because uh, we only have a constant number of portals. And so there are a constant number of subsets of portals. OK, so that's, that's a little bit. Uh, that's a little bit brute force. Um, there's a better way of doing it. This, that approach leads to a, uh, a, an algorithm that it runs in theoretically order n log n time, but where the dependence on epsilon is, is pretty bad. Uh, it's doubly exponential in 1 over epsilon. Using a slightly more sophisticated, well, somewhat uh, considerably more sophisticated approach, you can get the dependency to be uh, exponential in uh, a polynomial in 1 over epsilon. So singly exponential. But it still seems pretty bad, um, which is uh, which is one reason. That, so I thought this was a, a purely theoretical result. So I was very surprised there was a, uh, so CMX Tazari implemented uh, our Steiner tree algorithm the Steiner tree approximation, and tweak the constants. So the, the, the theorems and proofs say, OK, you have to set the parameters to this and that, these big numbers. And uh, so he said, well, what if I take the same algorithm, but really reduce down the constants and use heuristics to prune the solutions? And he was able to get very good solutions. The Steiner tree uh, approximation algorithm, suitably tweaked, gave solutions which were almost as good as uh, given by some uh, long, long developed uh, Steiner tree heuristic. So, and, it, and it ran much faster. So it seems as if these approximation methods uh, really do have some, uh, some meaning in practice. So that was, that was a bit of a surprise to me. You know, you do this theoretical work, you think, OK, uh, this is something that maybe people will study, but no one will actually implement. So, um, so I have this project. We're going to be implementing. A, uh, we're going to try to implement a, a number of of algorithms and and provide uh, the implementation uh, to people who want to play with it. So those will be that'll be uh, that'll be uh, posted on planarity.org when we get a little more progress. So now I want to talk a little bit on all the vertices. Okay, so analogous to the last session, we start with not a spanning tree, not a minimum spanning tree, but a minimum Steiner tree. And as I said, it suffices to start with an approximate Steiner tree. And there are simple and fast algorithms for finding a, a, a two approximation to a minimum Steiner tree in a graph. These, these methods don't even use uh, planarity. So you can find this Steiner tree, this approximately minimal Steiner tree. And now conceptually, Right, we cut across, we cut along it. Okay, just as before, when we cut along the spanning tree, uh, we cut along the Steiner tree. Okay, and open it up to form this face. And now, for intuition, I'm going to think of uh, this face now as becoming the infinite face. So we 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 turn it around, and now everything that was outside this face is now along here. And, and these vertices along the outside, these include all the terminals, right? Why is that? Well, the Steiner tree was required to include all the terminals. So when we cut along it, we actually duplicated those vertices. Uh, but each, each terminal is certainly represented in the boundary here. Okay. What next? 
So what would you think is the next idea? Based on what we did last session, what do you think would be a good idea here? At this point in, in, in the algorithm we discussed last section, what, what, would we, what would we do? What did we do last time? We have to add edges. That's right. Good. So how do we do that? What did we do last time? Does anyone remember? <laughs> Sorry? Take the interdigitating tree. Yeah. The interdigitating tree was just, you know, I like that. I, like, I use it whenever I, I can, right? So that was just a way of ordering the edges. And the, and the main point was, in this picture, you order the edges so that if you, if you strip something out, you don't, lose, you don't miss anything, right? OK. So why was it, so, so we considered just edges. And for, we considered edges in the order given by the interdigitating tree, the non-tree edges in, in, in the order given by the interdigitating tree, the, the, the tree of the dual. And what did we do for each edge? We considered whether we wanted to add it to our subgraph. And what was the criterion for adding it? We needed to add it. I can't hear, but. Yeah, so if the length of the, of the edge to even multiply by 1 plus epsilon is still less than the length of the boundary. Good. How do we generalize that? So, I, I, I mean, in retrospect, uh, now, I, I took me a long time to come up with this construction. But in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the problem is we can't just use edges here, right? Use paths. Exactly. So what we want to do is find a path that connects two points on this, on this boundary, connects two points, and uh, and we consider adding that path under what conditions? If the length of the path, even multiplied by 1 plus epsilon, is less than the boundary length. That's the idea. And we need some technique. So it, we, it, we need some technique for ordering these paths. OK. And, and, and this goes back to the idea you had earlier, that which, which worked so well for uh, in, in, in for edges, right? You want you want to choose paths that are sort of cover a minimal or or, or that uh, where the the boundary uh, the part of the boundary is minimal. In some sense, you want to choose paths that are as close as possible to the existing boundary. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Let's see how that works. So we say. A boundary to boundary path is a shortcut if its length is smaller than the weight of the corresponding boundary path, even if we multiply it by 1 plus epsilon. So the algorithm is to repeatedly find a minimally enclosing shortcut. Okay. We'll see exactly what the implications are of choosing a minimally enclosing, but that's the analogous thing that we, that's, a, that's, that's the thing that's analogous to choosing the edges uh, so that we didn't miss any edges. So identify a minimally enclosing shortcut, add, that short, add the edges of that shortcut to this graph that we're building up, and then repeat. And then we, we cut along that shortcut. All right. So here's 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 how here here's how it'll look. So we have this graph, and we're cutting along some some minimal shortcut. This shortcut from uh, from x to y. And then and then and then we 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 cut it off. Here's the here's the boundary length. And we remove this thing. This, this, I call this a strip. We remove this strip and continue working on this graph. 
So we're decomposing the graph into these strips. Now the same analysis technique will work here. Every time we, uh, we, we select a shortcut and include it uh, in the graph, the boundary weight goes down by a little bit. It goes down by at least epsilon times the length of the shortcut. So how much weight do we include in, in the graph at most? We start with a certain length. Uh, the boundary length is initially at most, uh, say, twice the minimum Steiner length times two again because we uh, duplicate each edge. So at most four times the length of the minimum Steiner tree. Now every time we add a, 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 a shortcut, we've got a reduction of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the boundary length. The, the boundary length can at most decrease by four times the length of the minimum Steiner tree. So the total boundary length of all these things that we added is at most epsilon inverse times four times the minimum Steiner tree. Okay, this is what this says. The initial boundary weight, the two times weight of Steiner tree. Well, so the total weight, it's, it's actually, a, we, since we didn't find a true Steiner tree, it's, it, there's an approximation there. Okay, so we get to, but that's, that's a bit of a detail. Okay, now in the, in the previous case, we were done. In the previous case, when we were only looking at uh, preserving distances among all the vertices, that algorithm suffices. In this case, we're not done, right? The reason is that these strips are fairly complicated structures. They have vertices inside them. Okay, that's what makes it more complicated. There were no vertices inside in, in, in the case where, uh, where we started with the spanning tree, right? The spanning tree included all the vertices. So they were just edges. But this case, it's a little bit more complicated. So we have to take some additional steps. Are, we, are you with me? Yeah, OK. All right. So this is what a strip looks like, OK? This, is, uh, this, this, this top part, say, is the shortcut. So the first thing we do is we, uh, we, we walk along the southern boundary. Well, first thing we do is for each node on the, on the southern boundary, we find the closest node on the northern boundary. OK. Uh, I've drawn these as th this is actually a path. This is because there, there are many vertices inside here. So uh, what I've drawn here is a little deceptive. These are, these are paths through the graph. All right. Now we're going to now we're going to uh, we're going to go through. So we're going to we're going to iterate through the, the the nodes on the southern boundary, and choose some of these shortest paths, and we call them columns. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll go through the process, but he, let me describe the algorithm. You, you start at this vertex, go to this vertex, and so on. At each point, we consider it a column. Well, here, let me, let me, let me uh, I'll see. We designate some of these shortest paths as columns. So let's say this was the last column designated. We're working our way from left to right. Now we're considering this shortest path. Do we make that a column or not? Now here's the criterion we use. Should remind you, uh, if if one alternative, so we're building up this graph and we're deciding which which edges to include uh, uh, in the graph. And let's say we've already included the boundary of the strip and also this 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 path. And we're deciding whether to include this path or not. Well, what's one alternative path for this, for this one? At least one alternative to, to, in going from the south to the north. Right? We, we travel along the southern boundary to this column and go up. 
And that'll get us to the north. So under what circumstances do we include that shortest path as a column? Well, if it's a lot shorter, if this detour to get to the base of this other column uh, is actually a substantial fraction of the length of, the, of this shortest path itself. So if, 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 if uh, the length of this is more than epsilon times the length of this, col of this shortest path, we then decide, all right, we're going to include that, that shortest path in the graph. Okay, and that's what this, that's what this uh, says. If the weight of the x to y subpath uh, from here to here of the southern boundary is greater than epsilon times the distance from this point to here, then we include this in the subgraph as a column. I call it a column. And, and then update, and, and, then, and now this is our new... This is our new leftmost column for the next time. So let's use the analysis technique to see, uh, it's a similar analysis technique to see uh, how much weight we're adding to the graph. Okay. Each time we decide, yeah, we really do have to add that shortest path as a column. We did it because the corresponding seg segment of the boundary had length that was pretty big, more than epsilon times the length of this thing. So every time we add a, a shortest path as a column, we're able to charge it to a subpath of the southern boundary. So the total length of all the paths uh, that we choose to include as columns is at most epsilon uh, inverse times the length of the southern boundary. That's what this says. The, the sum of the weight of the columns is most epsilon inverse times the weight of the southern boundary. So we, did the, we do this for all the strips. So the total length of all the, of all the columns added for all the strips is at most epsilon inverse times the length of all the southern boundaries. And the previous analysis technique showed us that the length of all the boundaries of the strips was in turn epsilon, at most epsilon inverse times the initial uh, times four times uh, times the Steiner tree. So it proves that the length of all the columns we add is at most epsilon to the minus two times four times the length of the Steiner tree. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. Just a sec. It doesn't have a signal. All right, so now we've developed, uh, we've, we've, we've built up the graph so far. So this is a little bit complicated. So now, for each column, 
let's say there's a column, we're going to add uh, what I sometimes call a fan. From each, from each, the base of the column is the, the starting node on the, on the southern boundary. And we're going to add paths to a bunch of the northern boundary. So how do we decide which pass to add? We're going to use the same analysis technique once again. Let's consider this red path. Do we add it to the graph or not? Well, what's an alternative to it? We can go along this here and then walk along the column and then along the northern boundary to get to the same vertex. So we add this only if its length is substantially less than this, this uh, detour path. If the length of this, uh, if the length of this, uh, this path, even multiplied by 1 plus epsilon, is still less than this path. And so on. Now, let's say we didn't include it. Uh, we, uh, oops. Let's say we decide the red path is not short enough. So we go on to the next, the next vertex along the right. OK, so we've considered this one. Now we go to this one. OK, and now we do the same thing. We compare uh, the length of this path to this length of this detour path that goes up and then across. And maybe this time, this is short compared to that detour path. So we do include it in the graph. Okay, and now in considering uh, the next vertex to the right, we have a new detour path to consider. Uh, we compare the length of this to the length of going along here and then moving to the right. Okay. Okay, and the same argument as used before shows that uh, the weight of the columns, I mean the weight of these new shortest paths can be bounded in terms of the weight of the columns. We use this, this same argument once again uh, to bound it in terms of the weight of the columns. So finally what we get in the end is this subgraph whose weight is uh, order epsilon to the minus 4 times the weight of the original Steiner tree and approximately preserves uh, sh all shortest paths between terminals. I, so I'm, I'm sort of skipping the, uh, the, uh, the proof that this preserves distances. Here's the basic idea. Take the shortest path between, take, take any two uh, terminals. They lie on the boundary of this thing. So the path goes from the boundary, it goes through a bunch of strips. And the important thing is that for each strip, it starts at the boundary of the strip. The, the subpath that goes to the strip starts at the boundary of the strip, ends at the boundary of the strip. So all we have to do is preserve distances. Uh, uh, and let's turn on the lights. We have the, can, can we have the lights on? I just want to show, show this in a little bit more detail.
So we first decomposed the graph into these strips. We had the property that all the terminals are, on, are along the boundary. And so a shortest path between any two terminals, maybe, maybe it goes like, like this. We want to show that this shortest path is approximated uh, in this graph. Well, because it starts and ends on the boundary, uh, the, the boundary of the whole of, of this, uh, infinite, this infinite face is, is uh, certainly part of the boundary of the strips. So every segment is a path between, uh, one, between two uh, vertices on the boundary of a strip. So, all, so it suffices to show that we can approximate distances within a, uh, uh, within a strip. So as long as we replace this path was something that is approximately sh as short, and similarly for all these other subpaths, will be done. So here's a strip. And we have some path. We have to, appro we have to make sure that we've approximated the length of some path. All right. First thing. Uh, if this vertex on the southern boundary is the base of a column, things will be easier. Okay? So what if it's not the base of a column? What if we didn't choose this, a column, starting at this vertex? That's right. So we know, we know that if this is not the base of a column, there's a relatively short path here to a point that is the base of a column. Good. So that's the first thing. And, and, the, and the length of this is small compared to the length to the Here's the shortest path to the north. The length of this, of this detour is short compared to the length, the shortest, di the distance from this point to the, uh, to the north. And so it's certainly short compared to the length of this path. This path is at least the length of a shortest path to the north, maybe, assuming we're going from south to north, uh, assuming the path goes from, from south to north. By the way, I should explain that case, uh, I mean, at that point. There's a, there's a simpler, there's a simpler, uh, there's a simpler question uh, before we get to this. So, what if the path through here, for example, goes like that? Are we, are we approximating such paths? So here's a path that goes from the northern boundary inside a strip to the northern boundary of that strip. Can we be a sh yeah? Sorry? Beautiful. Right. So this is a we chose this to this is the shortest path. So in fact, that's fine. This is we include these edges, the boundaries of the strips in the in the graph, and we have the shortest path between these two points. So such paths are are fine. All right. Good. Let's try, what about, it's the, what about the southern boundary? What about if it's a path from the southern boundary to the southern boundary? Now that's not necessarily a shortest path, right? Let's look at this strip decomposition. Maybe this path goes, say, maybe this, maybe when you form this strip, the southern boundary included part of a shortest path here and part of a shortest path here. But that doesn't mean that this 
that doesn't mean that going along the boundary here is the shortest path. So here, this path, how do we know, how do you know, we know we can approximate this path within the graph? Any ideas? You have an idea? Beautiful. That's right. We chose, we, when, we, when, we, when we found this strip, we chose a, 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 a shortcut that was minimally enclosing. And if this were a lot shorter than the corresponding boundary, we would have chosen this as the shortcut instead of the shortcut we actually chose. Does anyone see that? That's where we use the fact that we're doing these minimal shortcuts. So, this is a little bit more complicated argument than, than what we used in the, uh, um, in the case of, uh, of uh, the, the tour of all vertices, but it's not so bad. So we're just using this minimality. Okay. So the only remaining case is the case that we're considering here, which is that there's a, a path from the south to the north, let's say. The direction is not important. Okay. Uh, so we've already said that if, 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 the, uh, uh, if the starting point, the point on the southern boundary where the path uh, begins, uh, is not the base of a column, we can move it to the base of a column at low cost. The cost of this detour is small compared to the cost of the path itself. So now we can assume that we're starting at the base of a column. So, So here's, the, here's the, the column, and maybe the path that we're trying to approximate doesn't go to the closest point on the north. Maybe it goes over to here. How do we show that we've approximated that distance? Yeah, yeah, you had this fan. So, Consider the shortest path from this to this point. We considered it in the process of building this thing. So, uh, and we added some, we added some, some of these paths as part of the fan. So, so if, we, if, if from this point to this point, we included a path, the, the shortest path, then we're good. So what if we didn't include it? Right. If we didn't include it, then going along here, going along the previous path that we did include, and then going along the northern boundary, that was a good enough approximation. Okay. So that's, that's basically it. Um, uh, this is the construction for this is the construction for the subset one of the constructions for the subset GSP problem uh, and, and, and this is what uh, CMAC implemented now I haven't given much, I haven't given details of the implementation uh, it turns out that uh, you can run this algorithm, this, this construction of this spanner in n log n time, order n log n time. Uh, and uh, uh, CMAX implementation did not run in n log n time. It was n squared uh, for a reason I'll, I'll mention. And it still was faster than this heuristic. But what he discovered was that n squared was a very serious bottleneck when he got to graphs of size a million and so, so on. That he, he, he couldn't handle the graphs that were so big. So we're, we're going to 
we're, uh, this summer I'm, I'm planning in the next month or, or so to implement the faster version of this that runs in n log n time. So I'll mention where that n log n comes from uh, in a moment. But let's look at some of the steps of this, of this process and see how, how you can do it. So for example, how do you find the columns? Let's say you're given a strip. Uh, you, need to, you, you need to compute for each vertex on the southern boundary the shortest path to the northern boundary. It can go anywhere on the northern boundary. We just want the shortest, the, 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 the best way to get to the northern boundary. So how can you do that fast? It's actually simpler than that. On the northern boundary? Shortest path tree. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is you, 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 you can join all the vertices on the northern boundary, or you can just uh, uh, assign zero weight to the northern boundary edges, or, uh, and, and then run Dijkstra's algorithm, for example, and find the shortest path tree from the north to the south. And what that will do is we'll tell you from each ver for each vertex on the south what's the closest way to get to the north. So you just have to stand it on its head a little bit. And it's a, it's a straightforward, it doesn't require anything uh, sophisticated. Good. And then uh, uh, this fan is a little bit a little bit more complicated. Uh, there you have to use the algorithm uh, that um, um, that I gave yesterday, and also the strip decomposition. Okay, the for the strip decomposition, you have to consider all these shortcuts, right, and choose a minimally enclosing shortcut. And how do you how do you find a, a minimally enclosing shortcut without computing? lots and lots of shortest path distances. So it turns out that you can adapt the algorithm I, I mentioned yesterday, the multiple source shortest path algorithm, to do that as well. Uh, you essentially impose a tax on all the, uh, in each iteration, you impose a tax on all the edges inside, a, a one, an epsilon percentage tax. So uh, the boundary, relatively speaking, the boundary is cheap. Okay, now you're looking for a path that even with the tax, is shorter than the boundary length, and you want it to be minimally enclosing. So I'm not going to go through the details, but there's this adaptation of, of the minim multiple source sort of path algorithm that gets you an n log n algorithm for the, for the strip decomposition. So, yeah, so you can run this thing. So I, 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 I mistakenly said that CMAC implemented this algorithm. There's a slightly more complicated algorithm for Steiner tree, uh, that, and that's the one he implemented. So uh, this, this what I've described works for traveling salesmen, but not for Steiner tree. All right, so that concludes what I want to talk about um, the, 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 uh, about the traveling salesman problem. So now I'm going to introduce another problem, uh, which will uh, serve as the basis for your homework. Is there a question? Okay. So here's the problem. Uh, well, let me, let me give a definition first, in case you don't know the definition. Uh, so
So th this is a difficult problem. So I, 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 I want to see you know, what, what you can do with it. So, let's see. We've got So let's fix a graph key. Edges A and B. We write A is related to B if there's a cycle containing the two of them. So here is an example. Okay, so which edges in here are related in this sense? Uh, So for any two edges in this graph, there's a cycle containing them, right? So for example, uh, this edge and this edge, there's a cycle like that, OK? So the cycle need not be simple. So what kind of graph would we uh, would not have all edges connected to each other in this way, related to each other. Okay. So here we have pairs of edges that are not connected. For example, this one is not connected to these, not connected to these, uh, not related uh, in this way because there's no cycle. Uh, a cycle would have to use this edge twice, which is not permitted. Okay. So this is. This edge is called a cut edge. How many, how many have seen two-edge connectivity before? Okay. So this is, uh, we say a subgraph is Two edge connected if um, write this. for all edges A and B, A is related to B. And Two connected component of G is an equivalence class of this relation tilde. So let's see if we can identify the two edge connected components in this graph. What's one of them? This triangle. What? How about how about this this graph? Okay. What about this edge? 
it's a bridge, yeah. It's a, it's a cut edge or a bridge. It forms a two-connected component on its own. Uh, no, 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 that's not true. It's not, it's, it's for, yeah, I guess it's true according to this definition, but it's a cut edge. Okay. Sorry? It's not, it's not even too connected. So maybe this is not, the good, this is not a good definition. Uh, uh, and has at least two edges. That will rule out these cut edges. All right. Now, there's a structure, uh, th there's a structure that can be derived from this, uh, this uh, a graph by looking at the, the oh, sorry. I got confused there. Thanks for pointing that out. Better? Okay. Now, corresponding to this graph with its two connected components, uh, there's an auxiliary graph, which looks like this. It has a vertex for each two-edge connected component. And then if a cut edge connects two uh, two connected components, then the corresponding edge connects these. Of course, since we're using, um, if, if you were using uh, edge-centric definition, you could, you could say that this is, this is the same edge as here. So that's kind of convenient. Okay, so we've represented this structure of these uh, two edge connected components and how, how they're connected up. If you had another, another two-edge connected component here, for example, then that would be represented by another vertex here and another cut edge. Okay, now this graph is a, uh, for any graph, the corresponding graph, is the block cut tree, has a special property. It has no cycles. Sorry? That's right. So let's see. Let, let's imagine that it did. Okay? So let's say let's say there were a cycle. So that each of these corresponds to some two connected two edge connected graph. Proof by picture. What's wrong with this picture? There's no cut edge. So in fact, these edges are related. There's a cycle that goes through both of them. Right? So in fact, those are not cut edges. Did you see that? If you remove two edges, then it does disconnect. But that's, not, but that's not relevant to this definition. So we say it's a, an edge is a cut edge uh, only if 
removing that separates them. You can see that every pair of edges in, in that graph on the right there belongs to some common cycle. So the whole graph is, 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 uh, is two edge connected. So that's why there's no cycle. I mean, this isn't a proof, but that's the, that's the, the idea of the proof for showing that this block cut tree, that auxiliary graph, has no cycles. Okay, in, so it's a forest in general. All right, so now, uh, so what's the problem? So two edge connectivity is useful for redundancy. Did you, did you talk about this in the context of, uh, of uh, generalized Steiner tree or uh, survivability? So, the, yes. Yeah, I think so. To to it uh, to uh, no, no. What, say it again. Let's say, let's say this one and this one. Yeah, we'll have at least two edge disjoint paths between them. Yeah, that's correct. The flow between them is two. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the equivalent definition. So that's exactly that's a, and and that's a that's actually a, a great definition for what I'm trying to say. So uh, it's a desirable property of a network to be two edge connected. That way, if any edge, uh, let's say it's, an, it's a communications network, uh, if any edge goes down, the network can continue to function. It still connects everything, even if one edge is removed. If two edges go down, well, then you have problems. But having a little bit of redundancy uh, is helpful. So just, just ensuring that the network is, is two edge connected is a good deal. Right. So, here's a, so what kind of optimization problem uh, uh, should we consider? Take a graph with, with weights on the edges. So these are the, the weights are the costs that, it, uh, that you'd have to pay to buy those links or to build them. So the goal is find a subset of those edges such that uh, the entire graph is two edge connected. Okay. Okay, and the question is, is there an approximation scheme for this problem in planar graphs? So you're given a network. Uh, that's not the problem you have to solve. I'm going to make it a little simpler than that. So you're given a network, um, a planar, planar network with costs, and you want to find a minimum cost two edge connected subgraph. Okay, so there, there, there is a, a known solution to this. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than we want to get into. Uh, and the runtime is not so good and various problems with it. So I'm going to modify this problem a little bit. So it turns out... All right, so let me, let me explain how I'm going to uh, modify it. The, 
the input graph specifies which links that you can buy. But you can buy up to two copies of each link. And you can see how that might be helpful. Right? Let's say the input graph looks like that. It might not even be itself two edge connected. But to make it two edge connected, uh, you want to make a spanning two edge connected. So you buy all these edges and you buy this connect. Now it's connected, but it's not two edge connected. But we'll buy a second copy of this. We buy these two copies, now the thing is two edge connected. All right, that, that's a little bit of a cheat, and it's more desirable to be able to solve the original problem, but this is a slightly simpler problem, so we'll look at it instead. So I call this a, uh, a by subgraph. Take each edge with multiplicity at most two. So instead of requiring the output be a two edge connected spanning subgraph, or require it to be a by subgraph. So you're allowed to take these edges more than once. So this is called min cost two edge connected spanning by subgraph. Spanning means all uh, vertices are included. So I'd like you to work on, work towards getting an approximation scheme for this problem. All right. Yes? Say, say it again. I didn't hear the beginning. You want to require that it be two edge connected? Yeah, that's you can do that, but that's harder than I want you to try. But it's not even optimal because if you take a diagram of a square, one side of the square is very, very expensive. The other three are very cheap. But yeah, so the, the fact that in this problem you're allowed to buy an edge twice makes the problem computationally a little easier, or a lot easier. So, so I want to stick with that. Now, uh, so in order to get an approximation scheme, let's go through the steps once more. Okay. The first step is to find a subgraph uh, whose weight is at most um, a constant times the opt. Okay, and that approximately preserves the distance. The approximately preserves uh, the near optimality. For that, you're just going to use the same spanning, uh, the same spanner result that we did in the first session. All we have to do is preserve distances among all vertices of the graph. And the weight of that solution, that weight of that solution, remember, was order uh, the weight of the minimum spanning tree. And the weight of the minimum spanning tree, so any spanning by subgraph has weight at least the minimum spanning tree, because it, it, it certainly connects all the vertices. So that step is OK. You know how to do that step. The next step is contracting a subset of edges so that you get 
a, a, a bounded branch with graph. Now, how do you do that? You know how to do that. You just take these partitions, take k partitions for some appropriate choice of k. Look at the cost of the edges crossing these, these parts in the partition and choose the partition uh, that has the minimum cost of crossing. In each of these partitions, the parts uh, induce bounded branch width graphs. What's the next step? So let's say we did that. Solve in each partition. Right. And then we lift it to a solution in the original graph by introducing some of these contracted edges. We have to introduce the contracted edges maybe once, maybe twice. It suffices to include each contracted edge to, to uh, include it at most twice. So that's all good. That'll, that'll all work. So the hard part, though, is the, the, uh, the dynamic program for solving this problem in a, in a bounded branch with graph. So that's what I want you to take a look at. So the running time the running time is There are different running times that you get. It, you can, I suggest you, you essentially ignore planarity. Uh, and then you get a running time of the form some function of epsilon. And this is going to be an exponential function. I don't care what form this has. Times some polynomial in n. So you can achieve, you, it's possible to achieve exponential in 1 over epsilon uh, squared, well, for the DP, epsilon, uh, exponential in 1 over epsilon times linear. Uh, so the, the poly in n should really be n. In fact, it would be difficult for you to come up with something that's not linear in n uh, using branch width. Okay. So the tricky part is to figure out how, how to carry out the branch width computation. So this is, a, this is a difficult problem. So I want you to at least explore it. And I'll give you one hint that you need uh, that auxiliary uh, graph, the block cut uh, tree, that will be useful uh, in, in understanding what's going on. So do what you can with this problem. It'll be a, 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 an interesting challenge. All right.